Well, good morning. It's an enormous pleasure to be here at the best international central bank conference south of the Northern Pole. So, um, uh, again, many thanks for inviting me. It's a particular pleasure to discuss uh, Frank Smet's uh, paper for two reasons. Number one, I've admired uh, Frank's work since he invented DSGEs 20 years ago. And uh, uh, at the same time, it's a very insightful paper because of its role. He is um, Director General of Economics at the ECB, and this uh, uh, points, uh, this is systematic evidence on the effects of um, the world's largest economy pursuing a negative interest rate policy, NERP, um, systematically for the last uh, three years. And the paper he presents presents um, very insightful uh, new evidence on the effects of uh, NERB, particularly on, uh, on, on banks. Uh, I will talk uh, uh, about five things. Number one, I will extend a little bit his survey of the effects of NERB on market rates, banks, and the economy. Then I will talk briefly about the paper. I will do just three comments on the paper. And then I end with uh, two questions which go well beyond the paper. First question, uh, are we breathing, um, is NERB breathing the next asset price bubble? And the next question, final question, how could NERB be avoided in the future? Because NERB is certainly not uh, the best of all circumstances to conduct monetary policy. So are there things which could be done to reduce the likelihood of uh, future NERBs, which goes well beyond the current experience, which I think is broadly very well managed by the ECB? Um, uh, regarding the survey, uh, I, I put my RAs to work um, intensely over the last uh, uh, three days, so we extended the 11 papers surveyed by, by Frank and uh, Jens to 25 theoretical and empirical papers on NERP in Europe, and uh, here's a list of papers. What did we find regarding generally um, the effects of negative uh, DFR or NERP on market rates, on banks, and the economy. On market rates, uh, basically uh, all papers, the few theoretical papers, and uh, most of the other papers which are empirical, show uh, basically something which uh, is uh, very much part of uh, Frank and Jens' paper too, which is that NERP has brought down interest rates um, uh, both short-term rates and long-term rates has flattened yield curves, have re has reduced also on the short term and also on the medium and longer term uh, the safe government yield curves. Um, uh, and uh, so regarding rates uh, passed through, um, other than household uh, deposits, has been uh, high to full largely in this literature. Now what happened to banks generally? Um, uh, regarding the volume of deposits, uh, there's not much evidence, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit more mixed. The, regarding loans, it's pretty much mixed. Uh, three papers uh, showing a reduction in the volume of loan as a result of NERP, four papers showing an increase in loans. And this may be an empirical reflection of the reversal rate uh, uh, um, uh, lower bound, no, reversal rate level um, uh, which was pointed out by Marcus Brunemeyer and, and Kobe in the paper, very much also presented by, by Frank. Risk-taking increases, reserves come down, margins come down, profits come down, capital comes down, basically. So there is an unambiguous theoretical uh, prediction and uh, empirical um, confirmation that uh, generally this hurts, this hurts banks. Um, uh, basically because of the, of the, uh, the household deposit uh, floor. Uh, regarding the overall economy, um, uh, asset prices go up. The exchange rate, uh, not unambiguously, but generally for studies, it, it, it devalues. It is devalued by NERP. Uh, the lending channel pass through generally um, is effective. The asset price channel pass through on output uh, is a bit more mixed, but uh, generally uh, uh, asset prices go up. The exchange rate channel pass through, a devaluation here is confirmed. The interest rate channel pass through, not much of evidence, uh, curiously. Uh, not, not many papers actually on this. 
And the expansionary or contractionary policy channel, you see uh, uh, very few papers on the empirical side and of contradictionary science. The inflation level would go up. So generally, there's lots of evidence. Let me sum up. Unambiguous for the rates generally, other than household rates, household deposit rates, and more ambiguous if we go to the overall economic effects, very unambiguous regarding the financial positions of banks, uh, deleterious to, to banks. This paper um, uh, does what, <laughs> well, let me summarize again. It serves part of the recent literature. It graphically documents the binding ZLB on household deposits. It graphically documents also the pass, a full pass-through from the ECB's policy rate to all other short-term market interest rates, including very strong pass-through to short-term yields on safe government securities. It estimates statistically, uh, um, there was not much time, which Frank had, but he presents uh, regression results for, and documents on large to full pass-through with coefficients around 0.8 or so from the policy rate to bank loan rates, which is exactly what is the main purpose of this policy. And it suggests from graphical evidence that bank loans have not declined, not even banks are highly relevant on household deposits. I have three comments on the paper. Um, uh, number one, uh, uh, you present a hypothesis regarding um, uh, why the zero, lever, uh, uh, zero lower bound for household deposits is binding. And it would be because of some combination of the low household cost of storing cash, um, the bank uh, fixed costs in setting up offices, and their business um, uh, plans regarding households generally, household uh, deposit funding, and new liquidity regulation, NSFR, that raises the value of household deposits as bank funding source. Now, um, uh, it's easy to suggest, and I will do it, this could be modeled and empirically tested by the authors, maybe not in this paper, but in subsequent work. It would be very nice to document these, um, these, these uh, specific um, channels in a, in a model. Now, let me also add to this that in a future cashless economy in the European area or in non-European area countries too, maybe Denmark comes first, as announced by the governor of Denmark uh, one and a half years ago, the effective zero lower bound could be much lower than zero or even lower than minus storage costs if banks pay negative interest rates on site deposits. It could be full pass through in the future if this happens. Now, this is not around the corner. This will not happen next year, but maybe five years down the road. Now, this would accelerate, certainly, spreading of money substitutes, including credit cards, cryptocurrencies, um, um, not maybe bitcoins, but maybe um, the other better substitutes, eroding further bank deposits as a source of revenue of conventional banks. My second comment is regarding the fact that uh, this paper evaluates the effects of an IRP on bank rates and volumes, graphically or statistically, as a bivariate reduced form relationship. Now, alternatively, the model transmission effects of NERP to rates could be evaluated uh, in this paper by using a formal bank model, as done in part by Egatson, or Marcus, Brunemeyer, and, and Kobe, as, as referred to by, by Frank, that encompasses specifically the different transmission channels of DFR reductions into negative territory and uh, pointing out the landing, risk-taking search for yield, asset price, equity price channels, other than a, um, other than a, a reduced form uh, bivariate relationship. And finally, uh, my third comment is that, uh, as acknowledged in the paper, it is very hard to identify the contribution of NERP separately from the six other programs that expands the ECB's balance sheet, which are simultaneous to NERP. I put together this graph because in the version which Frank sent me, there was not this very nice graph which we have here. But you see clearly here that um, NERP started by the ECB something around June 2014 and two steps. And then uh, when the, you reach minus 0 0.2, nothing for a while. And then again, two steps around the end of 2016 or the mid-2016. But it's very hard to distinguish this from the other six, um, other six programs. Um, uh, how could this be done? Very hard. Um, so uh, it's, it's, 
it's, it's very hard to get reliable estimates of the effects of NERB on rates, maybe not so much, but certainly on bank lending volumes, on deposits, on the, on the bank financial position. One possible way to do this is going well beyond this paper. This cannot be done in this paper, but, the, but the, maybe in a, in a subsequent paper, is assessing the separate contribution of interest rate cutting and balance sheet expansions in a cross-country country panel sample comprised by the increasing, still small, but increasing number of countries or regions that have applied either or, or both types of price-based and quantity-based programs since 2008, which is the euro area, the US, partly um, with its monetary expansion, balance sheet expansion. Great Britain, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, and maybe a couple of other non, um, non EA member countries that have done this around the world. Uh, and this would be nice, I think, and has not been done. Um, question number one, which goes well beyond the paper Is this policy breeding the next asset price bubble? Um, if you look at uh, the U.S. experience of uh, the second longest um, uh, bull market in, uh, in uh, equity prices and stock market prices, which is still ongoing, it, it correlates negatively with monetary policy rates. The same is true other, to some extent for the European experience. Obviously, this is a bivariate, simple correlation of a, of, a, of a relation which is much more complex. It's multivariate and goes in both directions. So um, I searched a little bit, uh, and it's the same papers which are also in your paper mentioned, but for different reasons. For papers that try to isolate the uh, causal relationship from reductions in policy rates on stock prices, and there are only two papers, to my knowledge, I may be wrong on this, but recent papers, which is Wu and Browning and Wu, Wu for the US, and Browning and Wu that um, estimate um, the marginal impact of a 100 basis point reduction in policy rates on stock prices. So the um, Standard and Poor goes up by 4.45% in the paper by Wu, um, controlling for other things, obviously if you, the policy rate in the US is reduced by 100 basis points, much, much smaller in Europe and the Euro area, uh, uh, 100 basis point reduction by the ECB uh, uh, raises the Euro stocks by 1.11%. So not much of a worry, <laughs> so much in the US, and in Europe more in the US that these policies may be breathing the next um, a, a certain component of a, of a bubble or uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future, uh, cur currently. Now, these are two, two, two studies and much more studies and different models to test this, uh, I think, uh, should, be, should be done. Now, a question for the future. How can NERP be avoided in the future? How, how can central banks avoid this? And... Um, I ask this question by looking at inflation targets, inflation distributions in five very different countries around the world, very different areas, regions, and countries. So let's look at the distribution of inflation um, in, uh, in five countries using monthly data, year-on-year -year monthly data between 2001 and 2017, 17 years of data. Uh, these are very different, these country experiences, other than their only common feature is that they all exhibit a non-normal inflation distribution. It's Japan, uh, the Euro area, it's the US, Brazil, and Chile, with very different levels of inflation targets and very different distributions of inflations, and very different likelihood of getting into negative territory regarding inflation rates. So let's start with Japan. Actually, Japan started this experience in 1991, not in 2001, but I collected data from 2001 to 2017. The current inflation target, Japan, as you know, is a very recent newcomer to the inflation targeting community in the world with an inflation target of 2%. Their average inflation these years has been zero, 0, 0.1. And the probability to be in negative terrain after 2001 and until now is 55% in, in Japan. 
very skewed, very much keratosis uh, is exhibited by this distribution too, non normal. See. Um, if you're going to now go to the US, the inflation target of 2, average inflation of 2.1, non normal distribution, likelihood of having a deflationary episodes of negative inflation, 7%. Um, in the euro area, the same 7%, with inflation targeting of 2, which uh, um, on average has, has been close, but uh, at times it has been difficult to get close to 2, like uh, this particularly has motivated NERP um, starting three years ago, whatever it takes. Chile, uh, you have an inflation target of 3% since 2001, uh, 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 as defined by this central bank, and uh, actual inflation has been 3.3%, very close to target. Um, it's a non-normal distribution, probability uh, of having been hit by a deflationary shock, very short-lived, 4% probability, um, all concentrated in the year 2008. And Brazil is a country which um, has significant difficulties in hitting inflation targets, inflation targets of 4.5% for most of this time, average inflation of 67 and sometimes inflation shooting up to 20%, um, 0% of uh, deflationary episodes. Now, what suggests this in a very trivial way that the likelihood of protracted low inflation and deflation events and therefore the likelihood of having to apply a policy like NERP declines geometrically with inflation target levels and policymakers' ability to hit these, these targets. There is a fringe set of studies that suggests that advanced economies should consider uh, raising inflation target levels. This all started with a paper by Blanchard and co-authors during the crisis in, in 2007. I think it was 2008, actually. By Blanco and co-authors uh, who, who retook these arguments in 2016 and De Michelis in 2016. I think De Michelis is at the ECB. Thanks, I will take another 30 seconds and I'm done, Sebastian. There's another fringe set of studies, which I think is more interesting than the first one, but they should be combined, of a literature that argues that price level targeting is better than inflation targeting because under price level targeting, you reduce inflation deviations from the price level target trends due to stabilized expectations, stabilizing expectations of future inflation, and therefore reducing the need of NERP even if you are at, at, at sometimes hit by uh, deflationary shocks. This was all started by Lars in a wonderful paper in 1999. Uh, then Vestin, Kiley, Bernanke took up this argument one month ago in a blog or semi-paper which he has been circulating. I'm a fan of this argument. I think we should, uh, there should be at least a couple of countries at the forefront of inflation time who should consider this very seriously. So my final question is, could the combination of price level targeting at a price level and a price level trend rate of 3% or above, slightly above, reduce future NERP events? In all likelihood, I think yes. And this should be quantified um, seriously and systematically by general equilibrium simulations of extreme events like uh, deflationary events. That's it, and thanks very much for your attention.